Thank you. So just to give you some kind of background and context for this. So I joined the SEO industry about five and a half years ago now. So um, yeah, my background was in PR, public relations before that. But I joined in the month that Penguin and manual link penalties first rolled out, um, which obviously in SEO was a great month to, uh, to start. And I think the reason that I started or that Branded3 hired me was because they kind of realized that the way you'd been able to do link building for so long was, you know, it was, it was kind of easy, let's face it. Uh, you could do some spam, uh, you could do article wizard and all sorts of things, and it was fairly easy to generate links. And if you got enough links, it was kind of a science. You got a certain number of links, you got your rankings. You went over, you lost them. You went under, you didn't rank high enough. And that all kind of changed, and it is still changing. And we had to figure out a new way of doing link building that didn't kind of get clients penalized, um, because that's not good for anyone. And that's kind of where PR fit in. And we've changed as an agency the way in which we do link building quite a lot over the last five and a half years. So when I started, we had a link building team, which I kind of joined, but was kind of a bit separate because I was doing this new thing to test whether it worked. Um, and it did, thankfully, so I got to keep my job. And then we started having a PR team as well. So we then had kind of a link building team and we had a PR team. And then, thankfully, the PR team was working kind of better in terms of the results that it generated and kind of client satisfaction. So we moved over uh, to just having a PR team, which is kind of where we are today. Um, and it's kind of one of the biggest uh, areas of the business. And as part of that, because of how link building changed and the fact that we were doing PR, that also then meant that we needed other areas. So design and content and everything kind of comes together now to make this uh, creative team, which is essentially what I look after. But the way it's changed and the way we do link building now I'm going to kind of preempt some of the questions that you might ask at the end and that I normally get asked when I go through how we do link building, how we do PR. And the biggest one is normally, doesn't that take a really long time? Isn't that really time consuming? And doesn't it involve a lot of resource compared to how we could do it before? And I'm not going to lie, the answer is yes. It takes a lot more time, it takes a lot more effort. Yeah, it's time consuming. But the difference, I think, the biggest difference now is that what I'm about to talk about and how we do these campaigns, we're doing it for links. We need links. We need links to make Google happy, to make them recognize that our website should rank. But we're not just doing it for the links anymore. So when we did you know, forum comment spam and stuff like that, the only reason you were doing that was for a link. You weren't going to get anything else out of it. How many people were going to click on that link and actually come to your website? Minimal. Were you likely to make a sale from that? Definitely not. So those tactics were there just to get links. What we're doing now, and what I'm going to try and talk you through today, you're going to get links from that, but you're also going to get traffic because you're going to reach the right audience that actually want to visit your website. And those people, because they're the right people to reach your website, they actually have the potential of converting. So not only do you get links from it, you also get traffic, you also get conversions and sales. So yes, it's more time consuming. Yes, it takes more effort. But it also delivers more eventually. So it delivers the links and it delivers much more which will hopefully preempt at the end. I probably still will get a question around how long it actually takes to do all this stuff. But that's normally the biggest barrier that people think. Is it going to deliver enough? And it will. So, link building campaign process. So, this is broadly what it fits into. So, there's three stages. There's ideation, so we need to come up with an idea. We need a campaign that's going to get links. Then there's creation. We need to work out, okay, well, what does that look like? Is that simply a blog post that we can drive links to? Is it a quiz? Is it a map? Is it something interactive? Is it an infographic? What does that look like? And we need to create it. And then we need to seed it. Because as Joe said earlier, that whole myth around, if you build it, they will come. If we just create some awesome content, clearly people will link to it. Like there's these people just sat at home like, oh, I'm going to find something to link to today. Like that doesn't work. So there's a big seeding process. And people often forget that that's actually a lot of effort as well. And you can't just think you've got something amazing and that people will automatically link to it. So this is broadly the three phases that, it brought, that everything boils down to. And then within that, we've got other sections that I'm going to take you through. Um, so this is broadly what I'm going to go through in this session. So we'll start with ideation. And that all starts with the audience. 
So we need to understand who the audience is that we're targeting for our website before we can actually come up with any ideas to do that through our link building campaign. So there's three questions that I normally want to know about our audience. Which are these ones? So we want to know who they are. So that can be the demographics of them. That can be other anecdotal information that we know about who our audience is. The most annoying thing that I ever get from a client is like, our audience is millennials. Like, that's not an audience. That's not a group that has any kind of shared identity, really, apart from the year that they may have been born. That's not an audience. We need to know more about them than that. We need to understand a lot more depth to know what they might be interested in. We need to know where they hang out online. So if we're going to build links, we need to build them in the right places that they're actually reading and going to. We need to know where to reach them. And then we need to know what they're interested in. So if we want to get on this site because we know our audience are hanging out there, well, what do we need to create that will be of interest to them to put on there? So that's when we then know, if we find out all these answers, we know how we can reach them, but also importantly, how we can connect with them. So how we make them want to click on that link and come to our website. One thing that I found over the years is that paid teams generally have the best data. And I work on the organic side of things. We have a paid team internally. A lot of our clients do paid activity. But I didn't really have that much interaction with them. But I've got a really good friend that works in paid uh, on the kind of the PPC side of things. And so I've been to her presentations at conferences. And she showed me stuff that they could do. And I was like, oh, shit, why did I not think of this? Like, you've got to have all this data because you're paying to reach people. I'm not paying. I don't pay to put a link somewhere. I hope I've put it in the right place and the right people come through. But if they don't, I've put it there for free. Whereas they're paying, so obviously they have to reach the right people. So I learned that we need to make friends with them and get them to give us their data. Um, because then we'll know exactly who we're targeting as well. And it also it kind of takes away some of the effort if you can just get it all handed over to you. So as I said, my friend Sam Noble, um, she did a great talk about this. Um, so if you want to find out more about what paid data you can use, uh, what you can get and how you can use that, um, I've included a link on there. So that's definitely worth a look. But what you want to do is take a look at all those insights that you can get, combine it all together to give you the best view. So for example, from Facebook, you install the Facebook Pixel, you can find out everything about everyone that visits your website, because if you think about Facebook, we give Facebook so much data about ourselves. Like, Facebook probably knows more about me than my mum does, because it sees everything that I do online. And I've told it so much stuff. It knows what I interact with. So I can find out exactly who my audience is. I can find out exactly what other pages they like on Facebook. I can find out what kind of content they're sharing. And I can then understand more about them and what I should create for them. I can also use tools like social listening as well. Uh, so we use a tool called Crimson Hexagon. Uh, we also use BuzzSumo. And that can start to tell me more about for my topic, so say, I'm a fitness brand, and I know that obviously my audience works out. So I want to find out what they're saying about working out. I can put that into a social listening tool, and suddenly I know, OK, well, they like this type of content, so they prefer video content, potentially. Or they prefer an infographic showing them different uh, moves that they can do. I can find out, OK, well, they're most active on Instagram, so if I want to target them on social, I'll reach them on Instagram. But I can also start to find out, OK, well, the content that they're sharing about working out is coming from men's fitness, women's health, wherever else it might be. And I can start to pull a list together to understand that whole where do they hang out online. And I've got a much better picture now of who my audience is. And I also know what topics are resonating with them. So I know what content they're sharing on Facebook. I know what they're sharing on all the other channels. I can pull word clouds together and understand, OK, so something around this is what's going to engage them. Which brings me on to the topic. So once we know, so I was a fitness brand, I now know that I want to do something around workouts. I know that that's important. Maybe home workouts, are they a trend? I could try and find that out. So that's what I need to start to investigate. And what people often do is they go, right, we're going to come up with a campaign. It's going to be around this. Then you go into a brainstorm, you come up with an idea, and then you go out with it. And you miss out the research phase, which is what I'm going to go into now. 
So we know the topics that we want to create or an idea around, and we also know the publications. So we, we know that it's you know, women's health, it's men's fitness, it's whatever it might be. We want to research that more to know what's going to resonate and what they're actually going to talk about. So we can do this by doing site searches. So for example, I've got three publications up there that I know that my audience reads, that my client. What I want to know is, well, what kind of content do they publish? Therefore, what gives me the best chance of getting published on there and getting a link from them? So I can see, okay, video's doing really well. I can also start to look at, you know, an infographic, probably not worth it. Zero percent of their pages or, you know, certainly less than one percent have infographics. That's probably not the route to go down. I can see that though studies and research, well, fe they feature quite highly on men's fitness and women's health. So potentially doing some kind of study or research route would be quite good. Home workout, which I thought might work. No, they don't want to talk about that. But scientists and nutritionists, well, they're going to go down really well. So maybe I want to bring an expert into my campaign to work alongside me because that's what they like to feature. Um, and it's really simple to do this. It's doing a site search look at how many index pages there are, then look at how many pages reference different terms that you might want to find out about, put that together into a table and you find out your percentages, and then you know what's going to give you the best chance of getting coverage and getting a link on those key sites. And it's the sites that you know the audience are reading, but what also works really well to keep the client happy is asking them, you know, where do you want to get featured as well? Because ultimately, we know that a lot of what a client asks us for is coming from the board or the CEO, or it's coming from someone that thinks they need to be in a certain place. And even if we deliver the best SEO results in the world, if they think they need to be in this place and we don't get them there, they're not going to be happy. So sometimes just knowing that and working out how to reach them to kind of tick that box and keep them happy can be really good. So we had one client and for their PR team, who we worked with, um, their kind of one goal was that they're a British client to be in the sun, which is just tabloid newspaper. And that was their one objective, they just wanted to be in the sun. So as long as we got them in the sun, it didn't matter what else we did, they were happy. So it's important to find that stuff out and work out how to get there as well. So once you, you understand your audience, you understand your topic and what you're trying to do, you've got a good idea of what kind of stuff's going to resonate, then you move on to the brainstorm phase. And the way in which this usually works is you all get together in a room that probably looks something like this. You've got a blank whiteboard, and you sit there, and you stare at each other, and you hope that someone comes up with an idea. It's a bit awkward because you've only got an hour and you've been there for 10 minutes already and no one said anything good. And then you're getting a bit desperate and then someone, the loudest person in the room, normally me, comes up with an idea that they think is amazing and they start talking about that and because no one else is coming up with an idea, you start talking about that idea and then someone maybe raises something else and you talk about that and then you get to the end of your hour and you've got maybe three ideas. And it's just the three ideas that people were confident enough to talk about. It's not necessarily three really good ideas. Because we've kind of got this conceived notion of that's how a brainstorm works. Like that's how we come up with ideas. We get in a room, we hope, we come out with something, and then it's kind of what we've got to go with. And that's kind of the usual process. And we did that for a long time at Branded 3. That was kind of how we did it. And then we started doing some research and trying to see, like, is this the best way? Like, it feels a bit awkward. And it also feels a bit like not everyone in the room is involved and not everyone's very engaged. So we started to look at other techniques, and I'm going to share a couple of them. The, usually, the biggest problem that you have is that when people go into a brainstorm, they're not necessarily thinking about the brainstorm. So, for example, if I go into a brainstorm, any time between probably 10 and 1, I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking about what I'm going to eat for lunch. That's what I'm thinking about. If you do it towards the end of the day, I'm planning my dinner. My days revolve around food normally. Other people are the same. Other people, they're thinking about the phone call they just had before they came in the room. They're thinking about an email they received. They're thinking about the fight that they had with their partner the night before. They're not necessarily in the room. And that's why people kind of sit there quietly. Or... They're introverted, they're shy, they don't necessarily want to make their voice heard because they think, oh, maybe my idea is not good enough, people are going to laugh, they're not going to like it, and they don't want to share it. So, some of the things that we go through. Worst idea first, or what could we never do? So, 
One of the things that scares people into saying something is, is what I've just said, you know, is it good enough? Is it a bit of a shit idea? Are people going to think I'm stupid? So if the whole point of the brainstorm at the start is to give the worst idea you can, well, that removes all of that tension. And it's also a bit more fun than the serious, like, we need to come up with some good ideas. So it makes people forget what they were thinking about before, and they actually join in. And we found that... If you do this kind of thing, it's quite funny. People laugh. As soon as you get people laughing and engaging in the room, well, that's when you actually start to get the good ideas as well, which is great. And sometimes when you do this, if you write the ideas down, sometimes you can flip those ideas and actually turn them into a good idea. But even if you can't do that, you've broken the tension, you've got people feeling more creative. Figure storming. So this is essentially, if you were someone else, how would you come up with ideas then? So we first started doing this when, I don't know if you remember, a few years ago when Kanye West went a bit mental and was just tweeting random shit every day, and it was all over the news. So we did a brainstorm, and we were like, if Kanye West was in charge of our brand, what would he do? And obviously the ideas were insane. You would never do them. They were ridiculous. A lot of them revolved around Kim Kardashian, because that is what he would do. He would just put Kim over everything. But again, it got people laughing and joking and not worried about whether it was a bad idea. It just got them talking and saying things, which is what we want to do. Word association. So you've probably all played this at some point in your life. We play it in different drinking games and stuff as well. Just get a ball, you throw it. So I say anything. So I could say fitness, I throw the ball, you have to come up with a word. Again, it just gets people thinking about all the different topics and words that are associated with what you're brainstorming. It breaks the ice a bit. And finally, the favourite one that we've kind of come to is brain writing. And this is a bit different because it's silent. So how this works is you get everyone in the room, everyone has a sheet of paper, which looks something like this, and you do six rounds, and everyone has five minutes to write down three ideas. And it's done in silence, you have your five minutes, and then you have to pass it on to the next person, and they can either add to your idea above, or they can write a new idea. And there's a few reasons that this works. One being that there's a time limit, so it gets people out of their heads, and that rather than going, is it a good enough idea? They're like, shit, I've got to write something. I can't just have a blank piece of paper. So they write it down. And also, because you don't have to say it out loud, it gets the introverts in the room more involved as well. So they feel more engaged, and they're not scared to say it out loud. So it really makes sure everyone in the room is involved. It removes the awkwardness. They're kind of sitting there, staring at each other and you actually get good ideas. And as the previous slide said, if you do this properly with the right number of people, you get 108 ideas in half an hour. So compared to your usual hour brainstorm where you come out with a few ideas, that's pretty great. You've got a lot to then sift through and work out what the good ones are and what you can actually develop on. So once you've done your brainstorm, you've got your 108 ideas, you need to, re you need to work out what the best one is. And to do that, you need to do some research and answer some questions. So the questions, has it been done before? So ha do a quick search, has someone done that idea? If yes, it's not a definite no. But how can you do it better? How do you add value? If you can't add value, scrap it. But if you can, so say, sometimes the data's already out there. So we're like, we want to look into this. Someone's already got the data. But is it accessible? Do people find it? Do people understand it? If it's in like some complicated Excel sheet that no one's going to download, well, can we visualize that better? And if so, that's adding value. And journalists will want to write about that. So just because it's been done doesn't mean you can't do it. You just have to be adding some kind of value. You need to be doing it differently. Why will it be successful? So if we pitch an idea to a client, this is the question we have to answer. Why do we think it'll be successful? So we can look at things like Google Trends. So I know my home workout didn't work out with women's fitness, but say I was pursuing down that path. Well, there is a steady trend upwards. It's not, it's not in decline. It is a topic that's becoming more popular. That shows it might be successful. People are interested in it. People are talking about it. They're searching for it. We can also see there's a peak in January every year. So we know that if we release a campaign around home workouts, and we do that around January, there's a high amount of interest there. We can also see when the other peaks are, and you can map them too. So January is news resolution. I'm going to get fit this year. 
Then there's the summer one where everyone's like, oh shit, I need a beach body. I, haven't, I didn't really stick with that in January. And then you've got a smaller one around this time when everyone's like, fuck, it's party season soon. I need to get in shape for my Christmas party. So you know when the peaks are and you know that's when it'll be successful. That's when people want to consume content around that. We can see from using tools that I mentioned before, so the top one is Crimson Hexagon, our social listening tool. The bottom one is BuzzSumo. We can see that there's significant social noise and shares, and people are getting links around this already. So we know that there's interest. We know that people do want to talk and write about this. But who's going to write about it? So who are we going to target with it? So Crimson Hexen, like I said, we can filter for all the news and blog articles around the topic that I've looked at. So I can say, well, these people, they've written about it before, so they'll probably write about it again. It's clearly a topic of interest to them. In Busumo, I can do the same thing. So I can look at all the articles, I can see which were the most popular, I can export them. And they're another list of journalists and publications that I can go to. There's another site called A News Tip, and in that, you can see not just who's written news articles about your topic, but also who's tweeted about it. So they don't, we know that all of these people, will, they tweet about working out. So they probably want to write about it as well. So if I've got a good enough campaign for them, they'll probably write about that. What are the potential risks with the campaign, though? So does it need to launch on a certain date to make it successful? And if so, how feasible are your time sales? So say if I'm doing a campaign and I want to tie it in with the Game of Thrones new season, would it be ideal if it launched on that date? Yes. Is there probably going to be conversation about it for the next few weeks after? Yes, so I'll probably be okay if I'm out by a week. If I'm doing something, say, for Mental Health Awareness Day, though, well, that's one day. If I launch it a day later, the conversation's gone. Is there a risk that data might not show what you want? So often we'll do surveys. We need to make sure it's going to come back with what we want to say, because otherwise that can let us down. Will people buy our credibility on the topic? So what, what makes me able to say something? So we did a campaign with um, a client of ours who sells kitchens, and we did it around nutritional content of different snacks. Would you buy the credibility of a kitchen company on the nutritional content of a snack? Probably not. So we partnered with a nutritionist who was well known and respected, and you buy their credibility. So you can almost get experts involved to get credibility by association with your campaign. And then you need to test the idea. So before you invest any resource in building this, we want to test that we're going to get the results. So don't invest any time until you've got feedback that targets like this. So this is an example uh, that David, one of the guys in the PR team, so he's come up with an idea for a client. He emails the journalist saying, I just want some feedback on this idea. Do you like it? And the journalist replies, and he gives you advice. He says, if you do it in this way, we'd definitely publish it. I think around, along these lines. And it gives you that reassurance that, yes, journalists are interested in it. My research was right. So do this with warm contacts, so people that you either have a relationship with or you know have written about that topic before. And then you move on to the creation stage. We find that having data associated with our campaigns is really useful. It gives us a really strong hook. Journalists like to write about it. And there's lots of different types of data. I'm going to go through a few examples now. So the first one, this is using social media data. Essentially what they've done is they've pulled everyone that's talking about different foods and they've just mapped it to where they're talking about it. So New York City talks about bacon the most. You can go through, you can click on different cities, you can click on different foods, and it'll tell you who's talking about it. They've just used social listening to be able to do that. So social media data is something that not only can inform your campaign, but that you can use in your campaign. Public data, so this is something we did that looked at uh, paternity rights. And this is taken from, this is for a UK client, and it's taken just from ONS data and government data around what the rights are for fathers and how they're implemented. And all we've done is written it up, created some graphs, and we've made a story from that. We didn't have to pay anything for that data. Business data, so some of you might remember this. This is the sex map that was done by Love Honey. It was one of the first campaigns that I saw that I really liked, actually. And essentially, all they did was they took their data on who was buying sex toys and sex products around the UK and stuck it on a map so you could look at where you were from and you could see what the top product was for that area. Sex sells. Journalists want to write about that. That was great. That's just their own data. They didn't have to pay for that. 
sometimes you do need to pay. So this is a uh, campaign we did where we surveyed people across Britain and we asked them different criteria. So how safe do you feel in your area? How welcoming is it? How friendly? And then again, we just mapped that and we rerun it every six months so we can see whether it's gone up or down. You can create your own data. So this is a quiz we did. You answer different questions, don't look at my answers. I don't actually drive, you'll be pleased to know when I go through this. Um, but this essentially just tests your knowledge on the Green Cross code, um, all the different driving questions that you get, get asked in your driving test in the UK to see if people have been driving for, say, five years, could they still pass their test today? We collect that data, we can then release that data to the press. Then assets, what's the best asset for your campaign? So I've gone through a few different interactive ones there. But what is the best form? It doesn't always have to be a huge interactive. I did some analysis of our campaigns, and actually, some of the ones like the blog post that I showed you, actually, they sometimes get more links than the interactive ones. So you need to work out what's going to perform best. And the kind of site searching stuff that I did earlier, that can help you. And then on seeding. So influencer research is key. So you've got your list of who you want to contact. But you need to do some research into them to see how you can personalise your email to them. And Twitter is your best friend for this. You can do so much stalking on Twitter. And one example is, again, emailing someone. So he's looking for journalists to write about something. He's had a look on his Twitter. He sees that he's gone to see the band Space. So he includes that in the first part of his email to build a relationship with that journalist and show that they've got something in common. And then he goes on to the actual campaign that he's pitching to the journalist. And the guy replies, and he's really happy. He wants to tell him all about when he went to see Space, the band, and how that went. And he also says, yep, yeah, I'll write about your campaign. We'll get it on, a, on the website over the weekend. So we've got our link, because we did that little bit of research first. We built that relationship. So that's really important. But it's not just about personal interest. So that's about the band that he's interested in. You also want to know what they've written about previously. And like I said earlier, a news tip can help you do that. So you search for something, it tells you if they've written about it. So in terms of your email pitch, what does that need to look like? It's important to personalise. So as I just showed, showing that you know that they've got an interest in it. Always use their name. The most important thing is to outline why you think your story is of interest. So is it a certain column that they write, about, write for? Is it a topic that they've written about before? Is it a follow-on to something? You need to outline that, make it really clear to the journalist why you've contacted them, because they get hundreds of emails a day. If yours just looks like a cold email like everyone else's, it won't get the pickup. And give them all the information they need to write the story. So a lot of people have this thing where they'll send an email kind of as a tease, like, oh, I've got this story for you, or I've got this data, or I've got this image. And the journalist then has to email you back to get it. That's a barrier. Give them everything they need so they can publish it. They're time poor. They don't want to be playing games to get something from you. If they can just take it from our email and publish it straight away, they will do. Social seeding can help, so there's all sorts of different paid media that we'll use. For example, the quiz that I mentioned, in that kind of scenario, we'll do some paid seeding first. Oh, it's gone off this screen, it's still on there. Um, to drive people to the quiz, to then get the plays so that we've got the data to analyse and seed to journalists. Uh, monitoring, so throughout the seeding of your campaign, you want to be monitoring what's happening. So work out which angles are performing best um, so that you can play those up in your future outreach. So if we've got a stat around people from that quiz, you know, people don't understand um, speed limits and that's the one that's getting all the press, let's play that angle up with journalists in the future. Make sure you've got alerts set up so you can see all the coverage and links going live. You don't want to miss out on anything when you're reporting on it. Uh, BuzzSumo, I find as a tool, gives me the best results in terms of monitoring. So quickly, putting it all together, this is a campaign that we did for a company called Stavely Head, which are an insurance company. We got in touch with a journalist ahead of time, so this is the email reply to us testing it, saying, we're thinking of doing this, is it of interest, would you write about it? She said yes, if you do it like this. She published the exclusive on their website, um, and then everyone else that we wanted to hit published it as well. It actually performed so well that the London mayor, so the, the campaign was all around how dirty the underground was and the cleanliness of different transport in London. And there was kind of outrage because we found a load of superbugs on the tube. So the London mayor actually had to come out and announce a super clean to say that they were actually going to clean the tube as a result of the campaign, which was not something we were aiming for, but great nonetheless, because I live in London, I would prefer it to be cleaner. 
But so that happened, which gave us a kind of second wave of coverage and links. But importantly, what did that mean? So as I said at the start, it's not just about getting links, it's about the other benefits that we get alongside it. So we got a huge spike in online conversations. So people talking about the client was up 162%. And we can see that it is the campaign from the word cloud. Well, that is what they were talking about. So it worked. It got people talking about the client, which in fairness is a pretty boring client. They're an insurance company. It led to traffic, though, more importantly. So you can see when the campaign launched, you can see when the mayor's announcement, we got people through to the site. We didn't just get links that no one was going to follow, they came through. And it helps their visibility. So you can see they were on decline, they'd gone down for some of their keywords, but suddenly we've got them up there, we've done what we wanted to do, we've helped their SEO. And the client was happy, the client gave us a lovely quote about how happy they were with the campaign and what it delivered. So just to summarise, research is key at every stage of the campaign. So don't underestimate why you should inve invest that time in doing the research. Data is your friend. I'd never used to use as much data as I do now working in this role. Um, but tracking everything helps us to optimise everything. Um, so we know we've got a better idea of whether something's going to be successful. Um, and don't try to rush the process. So don't think, oh, we can skip the research and just go straight to brainstorm and creation because you might not get a successful campaign. It's important to go through every stage. Thank you. So, thank you, Laura. That was really inspiring. Was my marketing team here? Maybe we have <laughs> time for one question. Was my marketing team in the room? Yay! Did we see that? <laughs> yes. So I think we have time for one question. If, okay. if you want to throw it to someone, maybe you want to do that. Someone has a question for Laura. I don't think Nobody anyone wants me to that. throw this at them. Nobody. No. Oh, Omar has one. Throw it to Omar. Catch. Yes, so you give a little bit of advice on how to send an email so you don't want it to come across as cold. Um, but I can imagine that be one of the hardest things to do. I mean, I'm one of the guys who gets like a ton of mails, emails every week for this kind of thing. You don't want it to be cheesy either. No, so how do you do that? <laughs> Well, it's, a lot of it is around kind of the stalking that I talked about. So, you know, find out what they're interested in because that whole thing that I showed around the fact that he'd gone to see space, that's probably the only reason he thought to reply to that email because he like, he'll have had a hundred other pictures that day. But if you think about like, if you'd just been to a gig and you loved that gig and someone emailed you about the gig, would you want to reply and talk about it? Yeah, or another good one is like a TV show or a film. So if, I could, so if I find a journalist that I know watches Game of Thrones, if I email them and talk about Game of Thrones, they're so much more likely to reply because anyone that has that kind of association on music or TV or film or something, you want to talk about that more. And then you're also just more likely to do what someone's asked you to do. So you're more likely to actually look at the campaign that they've sent you. So yeah, do the research, kind of do the stalking and they're more likely to reply, but also make it relevant. So a lot of people still just do like mail mergers and send it off to everyone. If you can highlight, like I said, why you think it's of interest. So if you can say, you wrote, I saw that you wrote this article about this, and that's why I thought you'd be interested in this. It kind of jogs their memory and they're like, oh yeah, that is similar, like I will write about that. You have another question? I do, actually. Very short one. Okay. So what's your process for defining what is a good link? For what is a good link? Um, well, like I said, so we do, we mainly do PR now. Um, so in terms of like site quality, we don't need to worry so much about that. Um, for us, so a good link doesn't necessarily have to have SEO value, which is kind of a weird thing to say, we're talking about SEO. A good link for us has to bring one of the benefits that we want for our clients. So we want traffic, we want engagement, and we do want SEO benefit. But say, so the piece I talked about that was on the Daily Mail, the Daily Mail only give no follow links, so there's not really any SEO benefit there. But they also can send like 140,000 visits in one day, which for a small insurance site is amazing, and we can then retarget them. And also, if we get a link on the Daily Mail, the chances are a lot of other journalists write the articles from there, so that we then get a lot of good links and followed links from other people as a result of that link. So it's more about all the different benefits we can get from a link, but it has to give one. 
So like I was saying before, like a forum comment spam, the only thing you got from that was a link. And realistically, that link probably isn't going to give you that much SEO value anyway. But the links that we get now, they give other benefits. So that's kind of what a good link is for us. It sounds like a whole lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Link building is hard. Yeah. 